Welcome to the Nestle Nutrition Institute Education Series. This program is one of many developed to bring contemporary nutrition topics to healthcare professionals. And so I'm going to talk about an uh, interesting case from the Surgical Intensive Care Unit. Uh, it's my disclosures. I'm a consultant for Nestle Nutrition Institute, and, uh, uh, but we won't really be talking about any specific products. This is really kind of an educational endeavor, uh, which I appreciate. In terms of what we're going to talk about, we're going to discuss a care of complex pancreatitis requiring surgical therapy with persistent multiple organ failure. Uh, we're going to talk about some of the current guidelines on critical care feeding. We're not, I'm not going to spend too much time on the hypocaloric protein piece because Juan's going to uh, elaborate on that piece more. Uh, but the biggest thing I want to focus on in these cases that are complex, um, I think this is an area that we really need to collaborate uh, between the nutrition care team and the intensive care team. These patients are complex, and maybe I can get a show of hands here. How many of you round, uh, dietitians round with uh, in the intensive care team? So that's, that's awesome, and, uh, but the, I think we need to even further the collaboration. Sometimes these patients change metabolically on a daily basis, and, uh, and that line of communication is critical, and I think you know, becoming empowered to, to um, make these suggestions to your intensivist, because as you'll see at this case, a lot of times we're caught off guard by changes metabolically, and you're in the position of expertise to, to make the right recommendations, not just from a tube feeding or formula perspective, from an overall metabolic perspective. Uh, so this is our patient. He's a 25-year-old male with acute pancreatitis. Um, he's 136 kilograms uh, with a BMI of 43, and he was initially admitted to a small community hospital. And this is important because when we take care of the patients, oftentimes we're already 48 to 72 hours separated from that initial contact. Uh, he had acute pancreatitis. He already presented with some renal failure. He had hypocalcemia, high white count, high glucose, and then these other systemic inflammatory signs. Now, we traditionally use Ranson criteria, uh, but that's largely been replaced by other scores, like the Apache score, uh, which probably provide a more a, a better uh, predictor of outcome. But the big deal here with the ransom criteria and even these scores is we used to decide on where those patients should be cared for, ICU or the, the regular ward. And the guy like this, he's clearly inflamed, clearly has organ failure signs, so there's not much question on where this guy needs to go. He probably needs a higher level of care. Um, in terms of his diet history, he does not report a recent weight loss, but reports heavy alcohol use. And so he reports one to two fifths, so a fifth of a gallon or 51 ounces of alcohol daily. He does report a recent decrease in the past couple weeks, but still a very heavy alcohol use. He does report that because of this use, he commonly has very limited food intake during the day, and he reports concurrent tobacco abuse. Now, where this manifests is we get our initial imaging, and a couple things are striking. At, a 20, at 25 years old, uh, we see pretty dramatic hepatic steatosis. And uh, this is becoming more and more common. We've actually seen a number of liver transplant of people in their 20s, secondary to liver failure cirrhosis from hepatic steatosis. And this, uh, this gentleman has these early signs. In terms of the pancreas, that pancreas is something I call fluffy. So as you see, there's not uh, a, a clear outline. It's, uh, it's a little diffuse, and then there's fluid and inflammation surrounding the entire pancreas, and it's, it's quite enlarged. And this is another uh, scoring system that some providers use. This kind of provides a marker of severity of the pancreatitis. So two days later, he was uh, transferred to us, and one of the things we immediately noted, he had high intra-abdominal pressures. Um, he had worsening respiratory status. So uh, I was actually in, in the ICU. I took this history, and he, he declined pretty much in front of me within an hour. And he was intubated. He had worsening renal function. We proceeded with fluid resuscitation. One marker we saw, he had a fairly high triglyceride count in the three to four hundreds initially. Um, now, despite our high pressure ventilator maneuvers, he had worsening oxygenation. One concern that we bring up is the abdominal compartment syndrome. We can measure these with a Foley catheter or even a, you know, a manometry device. And what we see is he had a abdominal hypertension and organ failure. Now this is a tricky situation because so, uh, he has a lot of other reasons for the organ flare, uh, failure, not just the high intra-abdominal pressures. Um, on top of that, he had vomiting initially and high NG tube output. 
and, and at the same time a low dose presser requirement. And if you see where I'm going here, this is a guy that when we're talking, we're starting to get in our back of minds, starting to feed, there's a lot of barriers that are presenting itself. And so a first decision that comes up is, should we start nutrition? And remember, um, a lot of times I think even good trials that are and good research that's being done now on that patient that hits the door in the ICU. I think a more common scenario for our critical care units are patients that have been in the hospital system for days, if not weeks. And this may kind of shift the equation in terms of how long they've been at, without any sort of access to nutrition. And that, that changes it. Should we consider parenteral nutrition in this gentleman? And I think the base question, is our patient at high nutritional risk? If you look at the guidelines, their most recent guidelines on when we should start nutrition, uh, they recommend a scoring system. So we could use the NRS 2002, which is pretty easy. You can pull up an online calculator, and pretty immediately this guy falls into the high-risk category. He's, he's in the intensive care unit. He has a, a, a pretty severe disease process, and then pretty severe baseline malnutrition. He doesn't have that weight loss, but that's probably not that important with drinking the two-fifths of a gallon of vodka daily. Uh, the other part here is parental nutrition. If there's a contra uh, contraindication to enteral nutrition, it is recommended that we start parental nutrition, which did happen in this gentleman. Um, now, we were focused on nutrition, but a lot is going on here. By day three, his hypoxia worsens. We try different maneuvers. One interesting note is that oftentimes we think about proning these patients. We go through the paralysis and then proning these patients. In this particular gentleman, case series have demonstrated that you can turn abdominal hypertension to the full-on abdominal compartment syndrome just with this proning maneuver. Um, and you know, case series show this happens fairly frequently, and that's nothing, something that we weren't really excited about. And so we uh, activated our uh, ECMO team, and this patient was uh, placed on extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. If you see the devices here, they run off a lithium ion battery, they plug in, they can last four to five hours. Uh, 20 years ago, all these devices used to take up the whole room. Now it's a compact device. Uh, we can actually put the cannula in at the bedside. Um, and it's, it's certainly been an advancement in, uh, in the support of these patients. That being said, it produced a lot of complex sedation needs. We had paralysis. We have his withdrawal to, to contend with. And then metabolically, he's also hyperglycemic with starting with a high dose insulin drip. And if you see that final note, his phosphate was 1.7. So there's a lot to unpack here. Just with the sedation, this is another area where I think that the dietitians and the nutrition support team can really get involved, is that it's, it's a knee jerk to put these patients on high dose propofol. He has the hypertriglyceridemia. Um, it certainly interferes with, with your nutrition requirements. It's really easy to overfeed with the propofol because not only are you running it on a rate, but nurses are bolusing it for additional sedation, so it's really easy to get out of hand. Even without the propofol, if you look at this guy's requirements, over 100 milligrams of midazolam over the first 24 hours, uh, ketamine and quetiapine were added. Uh, we've been using dexamethamidine uh, pretty frequently as an adjunct, and, and this can help us avoid propofol in the intensive care unit if it's a concern. And the price has come down lately, so I'm a little uh, less hesitant to use it. In terms of our nutrition prescription, I won't go over this uh, graphic, but I found this nice graphic that elements the, uh, describes the pathophysiology of refeeding syndrome. Uh, our refeeding protocol identifies these patients, and then once they're at a, 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 a cutoff level of electrolytes, we start at 10, mil, uh, 10 calories per kilogram, and then gradually work up from there. His eventual prescription was as followed. Two, he was on a high protein. Um, 25 kilocals per kilogram of ideal body weight. And then we used mixed lipids, and then we had some increased electrolytes to, to base this off, off of. Now, why do we use mixed lipids? We've converted our entire inpatient line, essentially, to soybean, MCT, olive oil, and fish oil mixtures. And the, re the couple reasons is that there are some retrospective data that show safety and potential uh, superiority of, of this versus the soybean oil. We believe it's more physiologic. If you look at most guidelines, even before it was released, do recommend an approach that avoids exclusively soybean oil. Uh, and then the final thing I think to, to realize is if you, most of the randomized control trials that we pay attention to, um, oftentimes if you read the methods, are using the mixed lipid formulas. So when you look at the literature out there, really, and you try to apply it to your practice, really kind of take a look at what formula they're using.
Now we've settled down, his oxygenation's better because we have a machine that takes his blood, oxygenates it, and dumps it back in. So that's settled. But now the question comes, should we start thinking about enteral nutrition again? He had those high abdominal pressures, vomiting, high NG tube output. Should we even consider feeding with, or, uh, with severe pancreatitis? And then do we need to feed from a post-pyloric um, route? Now, in terms of the pros of TPN, you saw it. We were able to start it, start it rapidly. It's convenient. We can do pancreatic rest, quote unquote. Uh, it's easy to access. But however, there's not really great data showing a benefit. And then it's easy to overfeed. Glycemic control can be difficult. And we worry about things like systemic immune suppression. And it's a, a less physiologic um, way to go. If you look at the data out there, these numbers are not high, but they suggest some superiority, specifically with infectious complications of enteral over parenteral nutrition, uh, and even a mortality benefit. Um, with enteral nutrition, again, these are kind of logistic barriers and, and I think attitude barriers, increased emesis, people worry about aspiration, intolerance, diarrhea, and even visceral ischemia. However, that's quite rare and oftentimes not attributable to the enteral nutrition. It's more physiologic on the positive end. You have better glycemic control. It attenuates the hyperdynamic response and then hopefully supports a healthy gut immune system. Um, in terms of, uh, Bob mentioned this, gastric versus jejunal feedings, most of the data is very mixed and doesn't show a clear benefit and we've been moving to try gastric feedings. We could use promotility agents as well and we're often successful as in the case of this gentleman. If you look at diet uh, and amylase situ uh, uh, secretion there, this is with healthy volunteers, but remember with pancreatitis, you probably lose a lot of this response regulation, uh, but even in these healthy volunteers, oral versus duodenal feeds, not much of a difference in amylase secretion. And then finally, I think this study it needs some interpretation. This is the 2014 trial. Uh, showing on-demand versus early enteral nutrition in pancreatitis. And I think this is a well-done study, about uh, 200 patients. But one thing to note is these patients with pancreatitis uh, had an Apache score about 11. Um, persistent organ failure happened about 5 to 6 percent of times in these patients, and mortality was 7 to 11 percent. And most of these patients did well, and again, they were enrolled and by the time they even, with the late, quote unquote, late feeding uh, category, that applied to our patient on presentation. So it's a little bit hard to apply this. And then the other big thing is our patient had an Apache score of 17 to 23 and a predicted mortality of 40 to 60%. And so he's kind of really on the extreme edge of the, the ill pancreatitis patient. So uh, by four, his hemodynamics were better, but we diagnosed a pneumonia and we started probiotics. I'm not going to spend too much time on that, but if you remember in 2008, 2009, there was almost a moratorium on probiotics with pancreatitis. We had a couple issues uh, with the with the Besselink study. One of it is that they were using insoluble fire, fiber at high doses in the post-pyloric setting with high, high concentrations of probiotics, 10 to the 10th. And so we have a little bit more of a physiologic approach. and. Uh, and so far, we've treated thousands of patients with probiotics and have not seen kind of similar results. Uh, in fact, we published a series about 600 trauma patients, and we actually kind of are increasing our probiotic use in the ICU and decreasing our C. diff uh, uh, incidence. And so that's some pretty, some pretty exciting news, but we're pretty proactive about that. We started gastric feedings, and by day five, he was nearly at goal at 40 cc's an hour, and we we're able to wean the parental nutrition. Uh, his updated enteral prescription, we went with amino nutrition and a protein supplement TID for 1,900 calories, about 157 grams of protein. There was a question of pancreatic insufficiency, uh, and, and something happened that I hadn't seen in the ICU a while. He had a fecal fat test in the ICU, which I think I hadn't seen in about a decade. Um, but that did answer the question about further supplementation. Um, so we continued this course. We thought we were doing well but he had worsening renal function, and now he acquired CRT. CRT on ECMO is pretty easy because you just plug in right to the circuit. It doesn't require additional lines. It is, a pro unfortunately, a common complications in patients on ECMO. We also saw worsening triglycerides over a thousands, and he had a pancreatic drain place with concerning that this was a marker of worsening pancreatic infection. The question now is, should we change formulas? He has hypertriglyceridemia. What does that mean? 
If we change that, do we change outcome? And sadly, I don't think we quite know, but this, is, uh, this happens not that frequently with pancreatitis. Uh, excessive triglycerides can be toxic to cells. There's no real cutoff to say whether the pancreatitis was from alcohol or triglyceride. They can be high in either case. However, the higher the triglyceride count, the worse the outcomes uh, in terms of disease severity and organ failure. So there's probably something there that's important to treat. If you look at uh, the different components of hyperdriglyceridemia treatments, and again, this is an excellent example of where the nutrition team can kind of really give advice to the intensive care team. Uh, there's a number of treatments we can do. One of the things is insulin therapy, and we're already giving him up to 17, 20 units an hour of insulin on his, on his drips. That tends to activate lip, uh, lipoprotein lipases to decrease the triglyceride count. Heparin therapy, which he's on for his ECMO, also stimulates release of endothelial lipoprotein lipases. Filtering therapy, which he's essentially on with the CRT, it's not quite apheresis, that could re decrease circulating lipoproteins. Um, we actually started fibrates on him, and then we switched his diet to a low-fat uh, enteral elemental to just decrease intake. He was already on omega-3 fatty acids, so you see he was already on all these adjuncts and still spiking his triglyceride count. Um, and so what we did is we, after we made the change, we started um, a fibrate product, and then we started a low-fat elemental, and then we had a rapid decline in his um, um, triglyceride count. So afterwards, he was slowly weaned from his ECMO course. He was decanylated after 26 days on ECMO support. Um, and this kind of brings up a couple questions of what we were doing on ECMO, and there's a lot of unknowns here. There's a lot of metabolic CART advocates, but if you uh, have a patient on ECMO, you can't really perform a metabolic CART because their lungs aren't really doing much at all. Um, and that kind of creates a scenario where it's really difficult to estimate energy requirement. There's some work in pediatrics of looking at the blood gases and CO2 removal and oxygen utilization to try to kind of recreate a cart using uh, the, the flow of the ECMO machine. Not terribly well validated in adults. And if you look at our case, one thing we did midway is he had high insulin levels uh, requirements. He had trouble with his CO2. I mean, we, we can, we're very good at stripping CO2 with the ECMO result, but that can confuse the issue. But this is a guy I'd be really worried about overfeeding. Uh, he's, he had that prescription over 1,900 calories. When you see those things, you may want to try decreasing the, the calories to see if you can make a metabolic difference. Um, one thing we don't know, we knew he's on CRT. We have some data on protein requirements in CRT, but not specifically with ECMO. Um, especially with where we also do veno arterial ECMO, you wonder, could you actually maybe decrease your energy and protein requirements in ECMO? It's, a, it's largely unknown, and as we take care of more of these patients, it's something that I'm hoping we can learn more about. Um, so again, calorimetry is uh, flawed, and I think the question is, can we, um, can we uh, calculate this better just using blood gases? So, with him decannulated, he remained on nasoenteral tube feeding, and we switched to a standard whole protein formula as his inflammatory process resolved, and then his new prescription had lower calories and a lower protein requirement. Uh, he was discharged to SNF after a 45-day admission. He's discharged uh, to home afterwards, and now he has follow-up imaging for a drain. And uh, he may eventually need a minimally invasive debridement, but that's a much better scenario than having an open abdomen in the ICU and even a longer admission. So in summary, early enteral is preferred, but contraindications are quite common. Uh, you want to be aggressive with patients at high nutritional risk, including parental uh, supplementation when enteral is just not feasible. Uh, change, changes in formula can happen frequently. And that's why I think that close contact between the nutrition support team and the critical care team is essential. You want to consider the patient conditions when you're interpreting the literature. So don't try to apply, I think, studies with not so ill patients to patients that are, um, you know, uh, are of the really high predictive mortality. Uh, you want to transition to enteral when able, I think just from a cost basis, that makes a lot of sense. And then consider the effect of the organ support on the individual nutrition needs. I was a chief medical officer, as you may, uh, may, uh, many of you may know, uh, for Nestle and member of the board of directors for Nestle Healthcare Nutrition in the United States. They have funded two studies, 
And I, I think one of the great things uh, that I am grateful for Nestle is that uh, they've always allowed me, even when I was part of uh, Nestle, an independence of thought. And so I'm solely responsible for this uh, presentation. It is there for educational purposes. Now I'm going to uh, look into reviewing uh, new data in, in ICU management. And there, a, there are a lot of changes in ICU management. But I am going to focus only on the first seven days uh, of care. And uh, Manpreet uh, and Laszlo uh, talked a little bit uh, further, uh, and even out, in, in the outpatient, what I'm going to talk does not apply outside of the first seven days of care. Now, let's talk about what a paradigm is. A paradigm is just a fundamental belief uh, that guides our uh, field of science, in this case, our field of nutrition. And it's based on empirical observations, clinical observations, on historical examples and research. And we really have to be grateful for the people that have brought to us the paradigms in the past. They really are our lessons in that they are quite good at guiding us as to what we could predict is going to happen with our interventions and how we're going to help our patients. But at some point, as we advance in the care of those patients, and as we understand more about patients, and as I'm going to show, as our patients change, paradigms become less and less predictive, and we call those times an anomaly. That is, we start seeing results that we could not predict and that seem to contradict our current beliefs. And we call that a crisis in the paradigms. Now, that seems scary. We resist the changes uh, when, when they come. But the truth is that they offer a new avenue and give us a new awakening. And that is what I'm going to show. Don't be afraid of this. Let's look into this a little bit more. The goal of critical care nutrition, if I can summarize it into one slide, is very simple. The idea is to maximize protein anabolism and, pre and minimize protein loss through oxidation, and therefore prevent the progression towards protein malnutrition. Now, we all have an intake of protein, ideally, uh, and uh, hopefully we are now not maintaining patients in PO all the time. Um, if we go through the digestive tract, uh, 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 Bob showed uh, quite well what happens if we go through the uh, parenteral route. There's a li li little bit of a different physiology. Uh, but the idea is that the cell now has to decide whether it makes new protein or whether it catabolizes its own protein or uses the protein that we gave. The idea that we have in critical illness, the paradigm on how we feed patients, is based fundamentally on how we feed normal human beings. And therefore, we have to go back in history as to how do we feed normal human beings. Now, if we go to the far end of nutrition uh, in the 1800s uh, to 1850, the whole idea was how to feed prisoners. And as you can guess, the idea was to prevent them from becoming malnourished as they ate poorly. But it was also an idea of how to feed people cheaply. And that becomes a really important part. So we know that there is a history that if you're well nourished, you do have a compensatory time. You're able to compensate. You're able to protect yourself. Eventually, organ dysfunction occurs, and we call that malnutrition. And eventually, we go and die of malnutrition. And the person that is central to our understanding of how we progress towards malnutrition we, when we are normal is Ansel Keys. Now, he did this experiment during the Second World War where, where it was predicted that there were going to be millions of people starving in, around the world, particularly in Europe. And you might have read that, for example, the average caloric intake in uh, in Holland during the war was 1,400 calories for an adult. So there was a massive starvation. And the idea was, again, how do we feed the entire world population cheaply but adequately? And we focused, and all of us, and, and that's a picture of a volunteer being starved um, for six months. 
and developing what we called marasmus, protein and calorie malnutrition. And that is very different from protein malnutrition without calorie malnutrition. We applied the lessons that focused on giving this person calories at large amounts to protect their protein, what we call the protein sparing effect of glucose. We applied them to our critically ill patients because if we look at any patient, in this case patients undergoing elective surgery, we find that there is a significant decrease in muscle uh, mass and that they're losing muscle quite rapidly so that they become protein malnourished quite fast. Uh, and we know, by the way, that malnutrition in the hospitals is a real problem, that it leads to poor outcomes and increased cost of care. Now the question is, what are the tools? What are the tools that we have to improve this? And are we being effective at doing that? And so the assumption has been that all we have to do is feed people like we normally eat and use high amounts of calories like we were feeding starvation uh, patients during starvation. And in comes a salvation in 1968. And I, I really want to pause and give uh, Stanley Dudrick a, a, a real thanks uh, for all the work he did and the pioneer work he did. He really has saved millions of people. And so he was a surgery resident, and we know the story. He fed puppies, and he uh, used glucose as a main amino, uh, as the main fuel. Lipids were not available until 1980 uh, because the technology required a little bit more development. And he used an amino acid profile that to this day is not a perfect amino acid profile. And Bob talked about, uh, about uh, the um, findings uh, uh, in, in amino, amino acid profile and the importance. And if we look at n severely malnourished patients in prospective randomized controlled trials, we find that when you are severely malnourished, protein and calorie malnourished, receiving parenteral nutrition using the same paradigm of feeding a person, a normal person, works very well, reduces complications. But there is an anomaly that comes because when you feed norm, uh, normally nourished or mildly or moderately malnourished patients, you just do not get a benefit. In fact, you increase complication rates. And there's an additional problem, and that is my patients are now not protein calorie malnourished. They are protein malnourished. And in fact, almost 70% of my patients are obese with an additional 20-something percent, 25% of them being normal weight, and only 5% of my patients fitting into the category of marasmus, of protein and calorie malnutrition. So the truth is that the paradigm that I used to feed patients in the real, in the real world or patients with marasmus is not applicable to my new patient populations. We have tested this hypothesis several times. In, in fact, level one studies, I think we've accumulated now in the, in the literature over 10,000 patients. Multiple studies, multiple studies. Not one shows a benefit of meeting caloric goals. There's one exception here, which is Heidegger. That unfortunately is a rescue. That is after seven days. But other than that, there is no benefit. And in fact, the last study using absolutely the state-of-the-art way of feeding patients shows no benefit at all. So meeting caloric goals is of no importance and we need to abandon it. It is time to let go of that at least during the first seven days. There are two alternatives. That is, we permissibly underfeed. We say we just trickle feed a person for a week, knowing that we're going to run out of time at some point. Or we do what we call hypocaloric nutrition, where we give the other micronutrients and macronutrients, but avoid, uh, avoid a number of calories. And there is now a set of observational data showing that when you feed around 50% of, uh, of the calories to 70% of the calories in a person in the first days in the ICU, uh, 
and about 1.3 grams of protein per kilo per day, you get the lowest mortality. We still need prospective randomized controlled trials. So we did two different trials with the first phase trial uh, saying, what are the metabolic effects of hypocaloric nutrition? And we randomized patients into a control group that receive a standard high-protein pro high diet and a hypocaloric group that received high-protein but lower numbers of calories. Both groups received the same amount of protein, just so that the difference was in calories alone. And we published this data last September, I think. Uh, so same amount of protein. The experimental group received significantly lower calories uh, and significant amounts uh, or less, less carbohydrate. The results showed that there was a significant decrease in average blood glucose every day. Interestingly, when you feed protein with low carbohydrates, your blood sugar doesn't stay the same. It actually starts decreasing, possibly as an effect of the protein that we give, because that makes us sensitive to, in, uh, to insulin. So there was, uh, interestingly, a decrease in hyperglycemias, um, an increase in normal glycemias, uh, no significant uh, evidence of uh, hypoglycemias, a de decrease in insulin utilization, and some other evidence of metabolic benefits, including a protection of the liver, uh, which Laszlo talked a little bit about. The liver, fatty acid liver infiltration is not caused by fat. It is caused by excess fructose and glucose. Uh, and, and that's pretty well studied in the literature right now. So we then decided with this data on metabolic safety, are we still safe? And do we get any signals of safety? Now, high, very high protein, hypocaloric diets were started uh, by Steve McClave and others and our esteemed colleagues uh, here uh, in the bariatric patients, but they have since moved uh, into the mainstream critical care. That gives us a real world opportunity on how, on testing the safety of these diets. Again, we need to move from a paradigm that caloric intake is not working and is producing significant side effects. So let's move from that and let's look for alternatives, but let's look at it in a systematic and organized fashion and let's make sure that we are safe. And so we did this retrospective analysis we looked at Geisinger Health System, and I'm grateful that I've uh, worked for there for about four years. Uh, uh, also grateful that I was given the opportunity to do both industry and clinical work at the same time. We reviewed all available data. Uh, we had, I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Maureen, uh, 21 nurses uh, uh, going over the data. We did 2,000 encounters, so 1,899 patients with approximately two years of retrospective review, so quite a healthy review on that. We found that patients are distributed according to their protein intake uh, with standard enteral nutrition giving 16% uh, to 20% protein, what we would call high protein diets giving around 25% protein and very high protein uh, diet uh, with more than 25% protein, and that there was a distribution by weight. Not surprisingly, most patients receiving the very high protein were bariatric patients, but look at this. There was a good distribution of obese patients receiving standard high protein uh, uh, and very high protein diets. Very typical distribution in an ICU, 62 years, a BMI of around 28.3, uh, and, uh, and other just general distribution in sex, so not, not surprising. Most of my patients still get standard enteral nutrition, uh, and these two groups we could put together. Um, a, a good number of patients receive uh, high protein, and about 200 patients receive very high protein with about a little bit more receiving mixed uh, 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 categories, uh, and those we eliminated initially from the study. If you look at protein calorie ratios of standard enteral nutrition, uh, high protein, and very high protein, you see that the protein calorie ratios are quite different. Patients that receive very high protein diets do get less calories, 
than, than the other two uh, patients, uh, the other uh, diets. But what they receive is up to 40 grams more per day of protein. So by the end of one week, we have several hundred grams more protein in these patients. And this is highly statistically significant. So less calories, but more protein. Now, at the end of the day, what we want to see is the effect. And when we look at this within a month, inpatient's death, a little bit a good a trend towards benefit, not statistically significant in the hospital, but where we see a really strong uh, trend towards benefit, or at least very clear safety measures, uh, is that there is a significantly lower uh, mortality in the very high protein diets, hypocaloric, very high protein diets. Now, are there confounding factors? Absolutely. So for that, we try to clean them up using logistic regression um, and a multivariable analysis, and we looked at the effects of age, BMI, sex, primary diagnosis, diabetes, mellitus, dialysis, uh, uh, and, and other factors as potentially confounding factors, and we do, do these little statistical games, which have become quite complicated, by the way, at trying to determine whether those confounding factors explain the uh, observation of benefit in mortality. And the answer is some confounding factors, such as obesity, do, do affect, but even when we remove them, there is a significant benefit in using very high protein diets with lower calories in patients at 30 days. And so that tells us that a number of uh, uh, conclusions. First one is that meeting caloric goals does not prevent progression to malnutrition and is associated with significant side effects. It is time, ladies and gentlemen, it is time to abandon this idea that we need to meet caloric goals, particularly non-protein calories, early on in the first three to seven days in the ICU. It is time. It is also time to recognize that our standard diets do not meet the protein goals that are needed and meet excessive caloric goals. So we need to go to specialized diets uh, in, in our patients. And in fact, from in, in my practice, the very high protein diets have become the workhorse of what I use uh, because of my patient population and because of this data. Most patients will do just as well meeting somewhere around 50 to 70% of their caloric goals in the first seven days. Hypocaloric nutrition is associated with significant metabolic benefits in, in these patients. Increasing protein intake is, this is going on a limb. I am not sure will decrease mortality, but what we have conclude, uh, concluded and can conclude clearly is that it is safe. We don't see either metabolic derangements, nor do we see an effect on clinical, a negative effect on clinical outcomes. It is time uh, for us to start moving into large prospective randomized control trials and looking at this so that we can reach level one data on whether we should be radically changing the way we look at nutrition in critical illness. For you, Laszlo. So I noticed you got this patient through this disaster on adult ECMO, which is becoming more common today. But then when he left to go home, or before he left, he would put on a lower protein formula. Why'd you go down? Isn't the current trend to get, continue giving protein? Well, I think the, the, you have to look at the time frames. This is six weeks out from his, yeah, from his why illness. Yeah, not for a year? Give it for a year. Well, I don't, I don't think we have that. And then remember, we're kind of, he just resolved his renal failure. And my point is that he's resolved his inflammatory processes, and I don't think there's an indication to be at that very high protein range once you resolve your inflammatory processes, you resolve your organ failure, and you're really in this outpatient recovery mode. Okay, all right. That's fine. Sounds reasonable. Question? Yes. Yeah, hi. This is a question from uh, post-acute care. So we get the patients direct from ICU, and I'd like someone to explain the detail. 
in terms of we typically get patients from one hospital that uses a different formulary. It's a peptide-based formula, and they always have a rectal tube or a fecal man management device. So what we do is we are a non-rectal tube facility, so we remove the fecal management device, change the formula to our peptide-based formula, and within, I'd say, about seven days, um, we also use soluble fiber with that, uh, we can correct the problems with severe diarrhea. So it just seems that it's important to just, and I don't want to put anybody on the spot, I understand the political aspect of this, but there's a big difference in peptide base um, formulas, the fat composition. There's something that's so remarkable that we have case after case after case of showing such a huge difference in GI tolerance. I think it's good. Anybody got any other thoughts on that? I mean, the only other thing is that um, I think the ICU gets, they get blamed sometimes. Sometimes it's, it's appropriate. But then once they transition to the ICU, I think tolerant, intolerance of feeding is high in the ICU. And so as you transition, like you said, out of the ICU, yes, you see some differences. And some of the differences, I think, may also be explained by the change in the patient's condition, because they're more likely to tolerate it once that acute inflammatory process is resolved. I think, remember, the peptide transporter is the, is the first one to go and the first one to come back. We've got great data out of Japan that shows how fast the transporters come back, and the peptide transporter is the first transporter back after a major insult to the GI tract. That was done with chemotherapy. Yes, the question. Um, I have a question to Dr. Manpreet. Um, so in the presented case, um, why didn't you aim for the peptide formula straight away? Why didn't you want to? It, it's a great question, and I think the retrospective study showed that more than anything. Um, when we looked at you know close to 100 patients, um, we realized that why are we struggling so much to transition them sooner? Uh, it was more of we should try to make the standard polymeric work, try fiber, try all these other interventions, and you saw it prolonged the care for months and resulted in significant healthcare utilization. So now, you know, we're much, uh, we, we act much sooner uh, and switch them to like a peptide-based diet. Yeah. Um, just one more question. Um, did you consider uh, going for jejunal feeding uh, from the beginning or? The jejunal feeding, we, we absolutely considered it. Uh, where we had apprehension was in discussion with our surgeons who, had, who knew the belly. And they said that because of all the adhesions and the scarring, eventual jejunostomy would be much, much harder. And so they felt that easier approach would be to start in the remnant gas, uh, you know, the remnant stomach. Right. So that's why that, that was made. Thank you. I think in these post-bariatric patients, we see a lot of maldigestion, not malabsorption. Mm -hmm. It's a timing issue. You know, and that's, I think, a lot of our patients post-bariatric, as you know, these are the patients that nobody talks about post-bariatric. I used to be a bariatric surgeon. I'm a recovered bariatric surgeon. Like I, <laughs> and, and I would say, I, I'll talk about the complications. We created some disasters. And you know, when they were 350 pounds, now they're 70 pounds trying to maintain a little bit of protein in them is very difficult. And we see those in our GI clinic, in our surgery clinic all the time. Beth. Great job, everyone. Uh, one of the questions I get asked a lot, and I'd like for you guys to comment on, is for the older <laughs> dietitians in the crowd. Remember how we always had to think about the protein sparing effect of carbohydrate and how many grams per grams of nitrogen? And as we're going to these lower um, hypocaloric feedings, higher protein, that we're actually going to, you know, use those that protein, you know without claving off the amino acid, you know, getting to the carbon backbone, using it for energy. What are your thoughts about that? I think, Juan, you want to take sure. that? Let me start with that, but I would love to hear from others. Uh, we, we've been there. I'm, I'm an old uh, person now. I, mean, I have no hair left and my beard is white. Um, and so, so I've tried the protein sparing effect of glucose that you can see in normal individuals. And that paradigm just does not work in our ill patients. When you're sick, it does not work. So we've tried for 50 years 
for 50 years, we have had the capacity to feed as many calories as we want. And we have blamed TPN for it, by the way. If you look at our data, TPN is not to blame. What we blame and what we can blame is the excess amount of calories, particularly carbohydrates, that we give to our patients in the first seven days. You see a 30%, almost a 30% benefit in alkaline phosphatase in one week of a, of a standard diet versus a very high protein diet. That has to tell us something. You see a dramatic decrease in hyperglycemic events. You see a decrease in carbon dioxide uh, in those patients. So, so I know that it feels safe to say, I'm going to give glucose because if there's a protein sparing effect of glucose because somebody in the 1940s called man did what we call the castaway experiments and we need to cling to those experiments. That's, a, that's 80 years ago, guys. Okay, it is time to move on. Okay, one last question and then we'll sure. cut it off. Go uh, good morning, I'm Maria Smith from Philadelphia and I want to thank Dr. Juan for the Geisinger trials. I um, just, uh, I use the high protein, uh, low carb feeding in my ICU patients and have seen significant, incredible results with them there. Um, I love those products. And uh, I want to go back to the case study that showed the hypertriglyceride triglyceridemia, and um, in, in our unit, and again, it's a, it's a community hospital, but we have a, a great in intensivist there, and they have switched from propofol to avoid propofol syndrome and the high triglyceridemia. Uh, as soon as we see that triglyceride level going up, it's checked once a week, and we will move to the Presidex to bring it down and have found that successful, and we don't always correlate it with the enteral feeding. We usually correlate it to the medication. And I was just curious in that case study, was that the high triglyceridemia attributed to your high propofol load? So, so actually, I, uh, I brought up propofol because it's such a common bad actor. In our case, we actually, uh, was he was never on propofol. Oh, we right. actually avoided it altogether because he came in with a high triglyceride count. We and, that was, and actually, that's why what really pushed us that we have to do something else, especially with enteral nutrition, because we did all the other adjuncts and he was still spiking over a thousand. And so it was just kind of an additive thing where we, we I showed you all the, the different modalities and mechanisms. We tried them all and we still weren't working, so we added the, the fibrate, we added, and then we added the low Dabrin fat and, elemental. Right, uh, and one last question was that, were you also using, uh, in that, that patient is so typical to what I see, it's amazing, but um, again, a, a comment on a thiamine in that person, individual uh, for their uh, he, mental ability. I mean, he was on the thiamine as part of our refeeding protocol, but not the probably the excess long-term doses that you use as an adjunct as well. Yeah, like the 500 milligrams yeah, TID. Yeah. I, know. The okay. I know we're protocol. transitioning to our, our system using that, and I, I'm interested to see how it helps. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. I think we have to cut it off. I'm sorry. I, Got a quick question? Real quick. Okay, real quick. Because we got, a, we got a uh, Three seconds comment. No, at Mayo Clinic, we, for our sedation, we're using a lot of methadone and um, as, uh, to avoid all IV sedative, uh, propofol, Verset. Um, so uh, I think it's a, it's a good way to. Good, good comp. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you very much for attending this morning. Great session.